Thank you for joining this webinar. This will be a 30-minute look at two contractual provisions uh, that firms often face. From what we have seen, these type of clauses are prevalent when the owner fails to distinguish between the professional services design firms provide and the obligations that constructors have. The problem is especially acute when firms are providing professional services directly to con constructors. Construct constructors who use the same contracting forms to engage subcontractors as they do professional service providers are often unwittingly exposing you, the design firm, to uninsurable risks. And that's what we will be talking about today. So this is what we'll be talking about today. I will do an introduction and then we will go into uh, warranty obligations and some of the challenges you see. Uh, we will also talk as we uh, go through it uh, about the exclusions that your professional liability policy have in regards to warranty and liquidated da uh, damage provisions. We will talk about how you can uh, negotiate and avoid these risks and then we will conclude um, at the end uh, with some thoughts about negotiating your professional service agreements. So for all owners, as you all know, putting a capital asset in place is a significant expenditure. To get that done, owners need the services of design firms to provide a design solution to put the asset in place. That design solution, the set of construction documents and the spec specifications that accompany them become often part of the project contract documents. We are now assuming for the most part that you're in a design bid build environment. Uh, what that means is that your obligation as a design firm is really set up by tort law and the standard of care. However, for the contractor who is putting that asset in place, they, their obligations are established by contract. And owners typically require that the constr constructor issue warranty obligations to assure that the asset will be constructed and will perform as expected. They also require that the constructor have clear obligations about the completing the construction on time, and that is why we tend to see these types of clauses in construction uh, contracts. Just by way of review, we need to clearly understand where the issue comes in as far as design firms are concerned. As we've covered in earlier webinars, obviously for design firms such as yours, your obligation is to perform in a manner that meets the standard of care. That's what tort law requires of you. That's established by the standard of care. The standard of care requires that you perform services in a manner that is expected of another engineer or another architect or another surveyor, depending on your profession, doing those same services at the same time and at the same place. So you're compared to your peers. What this means is that you are not expected to, uh, nor required by law, to guarantee an outcome or uh, a particular result. result. Your normal expectation is that you will perform this, these services in a manner that meets the standard of care. Your obligation is different from what a constructor typically faces. By contract, the owner and the constructor are entering into a private agreement. And it is in those private agreements that you often see these warranty and liquidated damage clauses. The challenge for you all particularly is that these clauses often find their way into your professional service agreements. It could be unwitting on the part of the owner. It could be deliberate. And we will discuss those shortly. But when these end up in your agreement, you are faced with essentially a, an obligation that is not covered by your insurance because your professional liability policy for which you have paid to transfer some of your risks is based on the standard of care. For any liability that you have that does not meet the standard of care, your professional liability policy will respond. If there's a contractually assumed obligation that goes beyond that, 
That is a business risk. And the courts would look to establish exactly what your responsibility is. And for both tort and contract law, the court will look at what was your duty, what was your breach, what was the breach for which the lack of meeting that duty caused damages. And it is when we're determining what those damages should be and what the causation is that we often run into problems with warranty obligations because if you have established by contract a duty to meet a warranty obligation or a liquidated damages clause, then you are indeed in, you, you are responsible for those damages without necessarily having to show that you fail to meet the standard of care. So let's talk in more depth about warranty obligations. So what is a warranty? A warranty is a contractual promise that certain, certain things will be done or achieved. So if you promise to the client in your contract that your construction that, that your construction documents will indeed be fit for a certain purpose when constructed, uh, then that is a promise that certain things will be done. And if the promise is expressed in certain and definite terms in a manner that is clear, and if you fail to deliver on the terms of the promise, then you will be held responsible for that, uh, uh, for your inability to meet the promise. Now, as we noted earlier, the standard of care does not require that you guarantee or warrant a particular result. You, the expectation is that you simply perform in a manner that another design professional would have under the same circumstances. This is a significantly different uh, obligation when you issue a warranty obligation. So um, why then do owners impose warranties? Well, the reality is that the owner during construction, which is fairly complicated, and requires that things happen almost simultaneously and a lot of work go into it, uh, the owner is not in a position to thoroughly supervise and inspect a constructor's work. Uh, so for that reason, the over the years, the requirement is that the contractor issue warranty obligations, and we'll talk about what those look like uh, shortly, uh, to the owner. The other issue is that they, they being the owner, needs to be assured that construction is being performed in a proper manner and in accordance with the design. Uh, this is essential uh, because if you think about it, a lot of money and resources is going into that capital asset. And once that project is completed, then the owner has to make sure that this facility is indeed performing in a manner that was intended in order to meet their um, business uh, requirements. Uh, and the entity most responsible for that, once substantial completion has happened, is oftentimes um, not necessarily around. And if the owner has taken over the facility after substantial completion and doesn't have the benefit of these warranties, there really isn't much leverage that the owner has uh, to compel the constructor to complete the project. So, so what the co contractor is agreeing to be responsible for is making sure that the facts uh, uh, as of the warranty are true and uh, it obviates the need for the owner to monitor or verify the circumstances surrounding those facts. If indeed the warranty conditions are not met, all the owner has to show is that the contractor come on site and fix this. And let's look at some of these uh, provisions that we often see uh, that are uh, applied to the contractor. These come from the AIA 
documents, the A201 that governs the contract between the owner and the, uh, and the, construction, and the constructor. Uh, and as you can see, uh, there are significant obligations that the contractor has. Um, that the work will be free from defects, not inherent in the quality required or permitted, and that the work will conform with the requirements of the contract documents. If they do not meet these requirements, these are then they may be considered defective, and uh, so they need to remedy that. Um, another example of a material and equipment warranty obligation is the obligation for the contractor to come on site and repair anything that doesn't meet the obligations. Uh, oftentimes it is expressed in a term of one year. And so uh, again, this is a way for the owner to impose uh, certain obligations uh, on the contractor to make sure that the facility will indeed perform as expected. Uh, these types of warranties, if applied to your services, don't really make much sense. And we will talk about how to uh, suggest different clauses uh, later in the webinar. But for example, if you as an architect or an engineer or a surveyor are asked to come out and repair something, uh, that clearly goes beyond what you're normally responsible for. You don't have responsibility for how these things get built. That's not in your uh, tools of uh, skill sets. You're, you're not involved in the actual construction. Uh, so, you know, you should try indeed to make sure that you're only responsible for things, uh, for your services and not these types of warranty obligations. Off, we do review a lot of contracts in our pro program and we see this type of language oftentimes, uh, that your drawings and specifications shall comply with all applicable laws, statutes, rules, and regulations and the owner's guidelines. And if indeed that's the type of obligation you have, this is not tied to your obligation to meet the standard of care. Uh, so uh, code compliance uh, of this type is a, can be interpreted as a separate requirement that you agree to without any limitation. Uh, so these are the types of la language issues that you need to be, pay attention to, making sure that indeed your instruments of service do not are not defined in a way that lends them to warranty obligations. You're, you're also often faced with provisions that say that the drawings will be fit for a particular purpose. The term fit for a particular purpose comes from the Uniform Commercial Code, which governs the sale of goods. And these types of provisions are also often inserted into your uh, uh, contracts and, and could be problematic. Uh, recently, I reviewed an owner drafted contract that requires that the services shall be performed in a skillful, workmanlike manner and fit for establishing a reasonable bid from the contractor. Again, this goes beyond what you are obligated to perform um, under tort law. Uh, and it goes into areas where you are indeed guaranteeing a certain outcome uh, that could be problematic if a claim were made. So to recap, what is required for a breach of warranty claim? Was a promise made about the project or service the time, cost, result. Uh, and uh, if so, did the client have a right to rely on the promise? And if it's stated in the contract, they certainly did because it's part of the bargain for exchange. Did the party actually rely on it? And did the promise prove to be false? This is a significantly easier proof, a, bur a burden of proof on the uh, owner if they are indeed alleging a warranty claim. Um, so uh, the last issue then to be determined by the court is what harm did reliance cause and what kind of remedy is adequate. Uh, these, uh, this makes the evidentiary burden on the client much, much, much more simpler rather than going through establishing that you failed to meet the standard of care, which requires that they 
specifically allege how you fail to meet the standard of care and uh, it is uh, you're losing the benefit of providing yourself with a robust defense uh, in a, in a, when you're responding to uh, a negligence claim as opposed to dealing with a breach of warranty claim. So I just wanted to point out that your policy and other similar policies do indeed exclude uh, uh, contractually assumed obligations and are often very specific that express warranties or guarantees are not part of the coverage agreement between you and your insurer. Uh, and this is the sample language. This is this language comes from the CNA professional liability policy. Okay, so let's talk about liquidated damages. And indeed, uh, uh, what are they? Well, this is a predetermined amount a party must pay for breaching a contractual uh, obligation. And construction delays are often a significant risk to a project owner. Uh, as you can, as you know, uh, things like lost revenue, increased loan costs, storage costs, anything that impacts the uh, planned use of that facility, and specifically the schedule obligations, is a significant uh, risk to a project matter, to, to a project owner. However, um, the actual damages that the owner may suffer for construction uh, uh, delays are very difficult to establish. You would have to uh, show exactly what that lost revenue is, for example, how it would uh, compare to uh, what would have happened if it had been completed on time, did the owner uh, try to mitigate any of those losses. Uh, as you can imagine, uh, that can be a fairly complicated uh, uh, proof uh, for the owner to establish. So liquidated damages are there to serve as an agreed to substitute for actual damages. So uh, what that means is that the court is being asked to enforce uh, an agreed to amount for the contractor's failure to meet the uh, schedule obligations. Uh, and they will enforce these, and, and these uh, are indeed some of the uh, uh, requirements for uh, to to require to enforce a liquidated damages clause. The actual damages have to be difficult to quantify, and and that is uh, eminently clear in the context of a delayed construction project. Uh, the amount itself must be liquidated, which means that it has to be agreed upon in advance. Courts will require that the amount must be reasonable. Uh, in uh, specifically, courts uh, um, do not want to be in a position of punishing the contractor. Uh, it has to be deemed to be reasonable at the time uh, that they entered into a contract. Uh, and uh, if it's uh, not deemed reasonable, if it is deemed to be a penalty, and that may well make the da liquidated damages clause unenforceable. The courts, uh, courts from a public policy standpoint, are not in the business of penalizing uh, parties to a contract. So it has to be clear that both parties thought that this was indeed uh, 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 thought that this was an adequate compensation at the time they entered into the agreement. Uh, the other thing that courts look to is that it must be the exclusive remedy for the type of breach specified. In other words, the, the, the owner does not get two bites at uh, claiming damages. It, uh, if they have a liquidated damages clause, then that is what will uh, uh, govern. They can't also try to uh, uh, establish uh, actual damages uh, in addition to the liquidated the damages. So what does this look like? Uh, uh, this is the uh, type of language that you would see in a, an agreement that if they achieve fail to achieve substantial completion within the contract time, then they'll be liable for the sum of so many dollars as liquidated damages. Uh, and, and as you can see, this is ex, uh, stated as a, a damage for each calendar day, beginning the first day after the contractor fails to achieve substantial completion. So it can be a fairly substantial uh, burden for a design firm if 
you indeed have a liquidated damage clause. And the thing that you obviously should be aware of is that your policy specifically excludes liquidated damages. Uh, the only time your obligation to pay liquidated damages would be subject to a professional liability cover coverage is that if there were actual and measurable costs and damages to the client that are caused by your negligence in providing professional services. And that's what this language essentially says. Um, for your professional liability policy uh, to apply, the client would have to show the basis of the delay uh, and they would have to show the uh, uh, prove what those damages are. So if you are indeed working in an environment where you have liquidated damages uh, of provisions, you should consider these a pure business risk. It has to make sense from the risk reward perspective. And some firms do agree to these, knowing that it is potentially uninsurable. But if indeed the right incentives are in place, and if there are rewards for meeting the scheduled obligation, uh, and you feel that you are indeed uh, in control of enough factors to make this worthwhile, we do see some firms willing to share in that risk. But generally speaking, uh, firms such as yours uh, tend to, should avoid liquidated damages uh, provisions. And this is something that, uh, you know, our, our, our advice and from what we have seen is that it is, this is not easily managed uh, by your firm. Uh, the completion of instruments of services are often dependent on others, others being your client who's obligated to provide you with information, other service providers that the uh, client may uh, be engaging to provide you with information. And the other challenge obviously is that if you have a liquidated damages provision, you may feel compelled to deliver service instruments of service uh, to meet the stated deadline. And then that could potentially um, uh, compromise the quality of your uh, documents. So having said all that, uh, what can you do? And, and, and you know, we can certainly point out provisions, but you need to be able to come up with alternatives as you negotiate with your clients. So obviously the thing that is um, makes the most sense, sense is to uh, replace it with a standard of care provision. Uh, and this is indeed, uh, standard language that you often see in the form documents and make note of the last sentence that uh, it specifically says that you make no warranties expressed or implied under this agreement or otherwise in connection with your uh, services. This oftentimes lays out the uh, expectation of what, uh, what to do. Some clients uh, insist on using the word warrant. Uh, so our suggestion in that, uh, in that scenario is that you try to warrant that you will perform the services in an unnegligent manner. The reason being that the breach of warranty cannot occur without a determination of negligent performance. So even if it's a breach of warranty claim, the uh, reasoning is that in order to prevail on that, they still have to show that you fail to meet the standard of care and that the policy covers the underlying negligence. So here is some suggested language to get that uh, notion across. Um, uh, and, and, uh, and you wanna be sure that um, you are expressly disclaim all express or implied warranties and guarantees with respect to the performance of professional services. So that's what you want to uh, get across. When you're looking to uh, negotiate liquidated damages clauses, you have to explain to the client that this is an insurable uh, obligation uh, and suggest a replacement clause such as the following to recognize the client's milestone expectations and tie that specifically to the standard of care. And this is something that you will often see uh, being used. Services will be performed as expeditiously as is consistent with professional skill and care and the orderly progress of the project. 
this recognizes that the client does have milestone expectation in regards to your services and that you are indeed obligated to meet that, but it ties it to the standard of care so that indeed if there is a claim alleging that you delayed the project, the client has to show that you are negligent in order to prevail. Most of these clauses come into place when you are working with uh, contractors. For, so for particular uh, professional service firms like surveyors, you often come into uh, these obligations because the contractor insists on using um, uh, standard form documents that are intended for subcontractors. So to that end, uh, what you should be thinking about is that, hey, let's use a professional service agreement uh, that would significantly improve your risk profile. Uh, if the client insists on using uh, standard for uh, their contracts with warranty obligations, make sure that at the very least that your scope of services is very clear and well written. Uh, pay attention especially to your responsibilities during the construction phase and during the warranty phase because that's where these types of obligations uh, can be very problematic. And then finally, insist that your deliverables are defined as instruments of service because oftentimes what is being expressed as a warranty is to the content of your construction documents. And so uh, be very careful about how those are defined, that you are not indeed guaranteeing a certain outcome or result based on those uh, services. So that's it. Uh, I hope you found this uh, session uh, useful. Uh, what you're looking at uh, on the screen is the homepage for our School of Risk Management. The far left tile is where you can find on-demand uh, risk management courses for design firms. Uh, and uh, the far left tile actually shows you our new uh, Victor Contract Sifter tool. Uh, that uh, is available to all policyholders. Uh, but there's also more to our website. There's uh, the ability to uh, take some uh, continuing education courses on our on-demand platform and lots of resources that are available to you all. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, and uh, please uh, stay on the lookout for those webinars and the survey and the ability to download your certificate.